Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to today's webinar titled Enhancing Antibiotic Stewardship Programs in Critical Access Hospitals. Before we begin, I want to inform you all that the CE is available for this webinar. However, before I share the access information, I need to display the following statements and disclosures. I'll display each slide on the screen for less than a minute. That includes the CE portion of our webinar. If you have any further CE related questions, please send them to tceo at cdc.gov. Now I will go over a few housekeeping items. First, the recording from today will be available at a later date. Please do not unmute yourself. If you have any questions or comments, feel free to share them in the chat. Next, if you're having any technical difficulties, please send me an email to qzv3 at cdc.gov. Again, that is Q is in quiet, Z is in zebra, B is in Victor, the number three at cdc.gov. Now I will go over each slide with the CE documents. Just to clarify, there is no audio at this point. There's just information about the CEs. So for those of you in the chat that are saying you can't hear anything, you shouldn't be able to hear anything except for now that I'm speaking. Thank you for that. Before we get started, to hear the audio, please ensure your speakers are turned on with the volume up. To submit a question, use the chat feature located on the bottom screen for technical questions. Content questions will be addressed from the chat. Sorry about the chat at the end of the webinar as time allows. The slides for this presentation will be available along with the recorded webinar on the CDC's Tune In to Safe Healthcare website. Participants will be notified via email when this information is available. Now I am going to shoot it over to Melinda as our first speaker. Great, thanks, Jonathan. We would like to welcome you to the CDC HRSA Federal Office of Rural Health Policy webinar on enhancing antibiotic stewardship programs in critical access hospitals. My name is Melinda Neuhauser, and I'm the pharmacist and acute care lead for the Office of Antibiotic Stewardship at the CDC, and I will be helping moderate today's webinar. We are delighted to provide this webinar during U.S. Antibiotic Awareness Week and World Health Day. Next slide, Jonathan. The objectives of today's webinar includes describing the Joint Commission's upcoming revisions to their antibiotic search of standards. And Dr. Baker, on behalf of the Joint Commission, will be providing the, this in the first part of the webinar. And then in the second part of the webinar, Sarah Brinkman from Stratus Health will be introducing our three stewardship speakers and moderating a panel discussion on providing practical suggestions for enhancing stewardship activities in critical access hospitals. 
Next slide. And at this time, I'd like to introduce Natalia Vargas, the program lead from the MD Quip program at the Federal Office of Rural Health Policy, and she'll provide an overview of quality improvement in rural hospitals. Thank you, Melinda. If we can go to the next slide, I appreciate the introduction. Um, I just want to say I'm very pleased to be here with you today to celebrate uh, National Rural Health Day as part of another important uh, celebration in honor of, anti of um, Antibiotic Stewardship Week. Um, rural Health Day was created actually 11 years ago by our State Office of Rural Health Partners and the National Organization of State Offices of Rural Health. And I'm very proud to work in partnership with our CDC colleagues to be a part of this collaborative event to remind us of the importance of highlighting strategies to achieve health equity in rural communities. I'm also very pleased to work for an agency whose mission is to provide health care to people who are geographically isolated, economically or medically vulnerable. In alignment with this mission, the Federal Office of Rural Health Policy has a focus on increasing access to high quality care in rural communities across the country. And we're very fortunate to have the opportunity to help advance the goals of this administration as it relates to providing high quality care to rural populations. Um, as you can see on the screen, uh, just a few months ago, uh, our agency received $90 million to improve healthcare in rural communities. And um, our office specifically, we work with over 200 grantees to make sure that uh, these dollars translate to high quality care services to rural populations. So if we go to the next slide. Rural, um, our, our goals um, at the Federal Office of Rural Health Policy uh, center around this very important um, priority areas and that includes health equity, community health, rural hospitals and clinics and opioids. And I would be focusing on the uh, rural, health, rural hospitals and clinics uh, and the opportunity to advance healthcare in, in these facilities. And if we go to the next slide. And this is just to give a snapshot of who are the rural residents that we serve. Um, it, it might be surprising for you to know that 20% of um, the US population live on 75% of the land. That accounts to about uh, 60 million people that we're serving in rural areas. And this map shows um, just an example of how vast uh, the service area is when it comes to rural health. Uh, the green uh, covers all of the rural health um, areas and uh, the yellow covers all of the non-rural health areas. Um, and this is just an example of, you know, the different areas in which we have uh, critical access hospitals. We have a program that serves over 1,300 critical access hospitals. And if we go to the next slide. I just want to give you a quick overview of the MBQIP program. Um, our program is part of um, the FLEX grant, which is an investment of over $28 million that supports critical access hospitals efforts in improving quality of care and performance in, in um, financial operations in these hospitals. Our office supports quality improvement across 45 states that participate in FLEX uh, through MBQIP. And as part of our policy levers, we uh, require MBQIP um, participants to report on core measures that align with other federal uh, reporting requirements. And antibiotic stewardship is, is one of the areas um, that are part of that core requirements for uh, reporting. And again, um, our goal overall is to improve patient outcomes for people living in rural areas. So, um, we're very pleased to work in partnership with federal partners that also um, care for that mission. And, you know, I'm really excited to hear from others here today about, you know, how, how, to, how to best deliver this um, and highlight the strategies that would help us achieve that overall mission to improve patient outcomes for rural populations. And um, with that, the next slide just has um, some information on how to reach us. If you have further questions, this was a very quick review of our program, but 
I would like to give all of the time to the panelists today who will provide hopefully very practical information on this topic. Um, so with that, I'll turn it over back to Melinda for the program to continue. Thank you. Great, thanks, Natalia. And at this time, it's my great pleasure to introduce Dr. David Baker, who is the Executive Vice President of the Division of Healthcare Quality Evaluation at the Joint Commission. Thank very you, much. David, for joining. Uh, thanks very much, Belinda. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm really happy to be here to talk about uh, the Joint Commission's revised antibiotic stewardship standards. Uh, I have no personal financial disclosures. I did want to uh, say that the Joint Commission received funding from the Pew Charitable Trust to conduct a study of leading practices for hospital antibiotic stewardship. And this informed the development of the revised standards as I'll describe, but Pew played no role in the development or approval of the revised hospital standards. Next slide. So I'll give a very brief uh, background on the Joint Commission. Uh, we're probably familiar to most of you. Uh, and I'll provide uh, an overview, very quick overview of the 2017 hospital and critical access hospital antibiotic stewardship standards, what I call version 1.0, and then talk about uh, a leading practices conference uh, that were, was done about two years after the standards came out to really say, what's next? Where do we go after version 1.0? And then I'll dis, uh, describe the draft revised standards for hospital and, and critical access hospital accreditation, which is uh, that version 2.0. Uh, so we are an independent not-for-profit organization founded in 1951, and we're a private accrediting organization. We have deeming authority from CMS, but we're not a regulatory agency. Uh, we're not a branch of the government. We're the nation's oldest and largest standard setting and accrediting body in healthcare, and we evaluate and accredit nearly 21,000 healthcare organizations in the United States, including 356 critical access hospitals, which is about 25% of the critical access hospitals in the U.S. Next. Uh, our mission is really straightforward, to continuously improve healthcare for the public, in collaboration with other stakeholders by evaluating healthcare organizations and inspiring them to excel in providing safe and effective care of the highest quality uh, and value. And I think the antibiotic stewardship uh, standards have really helped uh, push uh, quality of care uh, forward for this very important topic. Next slide. Uh, so uh, our, our journey began in about 2015 when we first started developing this after the, the President's Commission on Antimicrobial uh, Resistance uh, came out with a report and really said crediting organizations needed to focus on this. So our standards went into effect in January of 2017 and they were applicable to hospitals, critical access hospitals, and nursing care centers. Next. Uh, and as most of you are familiar, uh, I'll just give a brief overview again of the key elements of version 1.0. Uh, uh, the first is leaders establish antimicrobial stewardship as an organizational priority. Next. The second is the organization establishes an antimicrobial stewardship multidisciplinary team that includes infectious disease physicians, infection preventionists, pharmacists, practitioners, um, with one overall leader and one pharmacist leader. And the pharmacist leader obviously can be the overall leader as well. Next. Uh, the hospital educates staff and practitioners. This is a, a pretty basic element uh, that uh, everyone was expected to do. Next. And then we get into the meat. Uh, the hospital's antimicrobial stewardship program uses organization approved multidisciplinary protocols. And these were listed out, but very importantly, we didn't say specific activities that needed to be done. At the time that we were working on this, it wasn't as clear as it is now, what are the things that were really effective? Um, so we left this vague, next. 
And uh, we said, as research determines which policies and practices are most effective, should we be more prescriptive? Next slide. Uh, the second uh, key part was the hospital collects, analyzes, and reports data on its antimicrobial stewardship program and takes action on the improvement opportunities that are identified by this. Uh, but once again, we did not specify what measures organizations had to collect. Next. And we asked the question, what measures are best? Um, and at the time, that wasn't completely clear. Next slide. So that led us uh, to uh, conduct this leading practices in antimicrobial stewardship uh, conference, which uh, I chaired and it was sponsored by all of the groups that you can see up at the top. And it was a really fantastic group. We had six uh, hospitals, including a critical access hospital leader, uh, come in and talk about uh, what do they think are the most important things that they're doing that every hospital in the United States should be doing. And then we asked them about stretch goals as well. Next slide. So the goals were to condense these recommendations to a focus set that we plan to publish and disseminate. And you can see the reference there for the article that was published from this conference. And very importantly, our goal was to identify those recommendations that everyone thought were strong enough to consider for Joint Commission accreditation standards. Next. So this slide shows the recommended interventions. Um, and you see the key recommendations were first engage frontline clinicians. This uh, you have heard about as handshake stewardship. Second, implement disease state guidelines and third, address inappropriate diagnostic testing. And you see the other recommendations there, which uh, they really saw as the stretch goal. But as you see down at the bottom, it was really important, says these recommendations should be reviewed uh, as uh, the, to implement, strengthen, or go beyond the traditional interventions, uh, such as pre-authorization and prospective audit and feedback. So that's straight from the paper. The panel said, well, these are really basic. These aren't really leading practices. These are what everyone should do. But as you just saw, we never specified that organizations needed to do pre-authorization and prospective audit and feedback. Um, so that's why we included this uh, under the recommendations uh, to make that clear. Uh, click one more. And now you see in red the things that actually moved forward into the standards, as I'll talk about, implementing disease state guidelines, addressing inappropriate diagnostic testing, and the pre-authorization and prospective audit and feedback. Next. Uh, the panel recommended uh, for measures, days of therapy per thousand days present or patient days hospital onset C. difficile rates, and appropriate use in concordance of care with clinical practice guidelines. Now, under the other recommendations, there was a lot of discussion about uh, measuring prescribing patterns of individual clinicians. They thought that was very important, as well as the total duration of antibiotic therapy. Uh, but everybody, the, the ones that were doing this said it was incredibly difficult. And if top people in the VA are struggling to be able to have their electronic health record uh, do this type of profiling. We thought that these were a bridge too far. Uh, click once more. Uh, so the two in red made it into the standards, days of therapy per thousand days present and appropriate use in concordance of care with clinical practice guidelines. Next. Next slide. Uh, so the next thing that we did uh, was a survey of hospitals, including critical access hospitals around the United States. It's very important as we are thinking about new standards, we have to ask the question, can every hospital do these things? And we like to see that uh, there are at least a significant proportion of hospitals um, that are doing things before we set them up as requirements, uh, because Again, even with our help, if we don't think that every hospital can do this, we don't want to 
uh, go forward with standards. So this slide focuses in on facility specific guidelines and monitoring adherence. And as you can see in the column on develop the guideline um, for these common things, the vast majority of hospitals um, have guidelines in place for community acquired pneumonia, sepsis, et cetera. And if you look down at the very bottom, you can see for um, CAP, UTI, skin and soft tissue infection and sepsis, um, there were 56% uh, of the organizations were actually had guidelines for all four. So from the standpoint of guideline uh, implementation, uh, the, uh, the country is pretty far advanced on that. But if you look at monitoring adherence, it's a whole different story. Uh, if you look down at the bottom for those big four, um, there were 37% that were doing at least one. But for any individual one of these topics, uh, it was only about a quarter uh, of hospitals that were doing uh, monitoring uh, for the guidelines that they had in place and, and often much, much lower than that. Next slide. Uh, and then uh, for optimizing diagnostic testing, uh, we looked at uh, two uh, topics um, as a drill down. The hospital has procedures to prevent inappropriate testing for C. diff and the hospital has procedures to prevent inappropriate testing of urine specimens. And you can see for this that the uh, hospitals have done much more to try and address the C. diff issues. About 66% had at least one procedure in place. Um, and uh, you see those listed and uh, we'll be circulating the slides for those that want to be able to, to look at this in more detail. Uh, but if you look at uh, implementing procedures to prevent inappropriate testing of urine specimens, uh, it was far lower. Um, so uh, that, uh, but still, uh, it was uh, almost 40% of hospitals that were doing this. So this we see as a, a major opportunity. Next slide. So now I'll spend the rest of my time talking about the revised standards. So there are several key elements from version 1.0 that are, are really stayed the same. Uh, hospital allocates financial resources for staffing and IT. Uh, the governing body appoints physician pharmacist leaders. The hospital appoints a multidisciplinary committee and leaders implement key stewardship activities. So those core uh, elements are the same. Uh, the first new uh, standard is uh, that uh, they uh, implement strategies to optimize prescribing. So the antibiotic stewardship program implements one of the following strategies to optimize antibiotic prescribing, either pre-authorization or prospective review and feedback. Now we had a lot of discussion about whether we should require uh, both of those. As I said earlier, most of the experts said that they really thought that these were both fundamental strategies, uh, but that was not the case in the survey. Not all uh, programs were doing both of these. So we wanted to, again, take that incremental approach from where we were in version 1.0 and move things forward uh, by requiring uh, at least one of these to be done. Next. Uh, the next was uh, monitoring antibiotic use. The antibiotic stewardship program monitors the hospital's antibiotic use by analyzing, analyzing data on days of therapy per thousand days present or a thousand patient days, or by reporting antibiotic use data to the National Healthcare Safety Network's antimicrobial use option. Uh, we strongly recommend that um, latter option, NHSN, allows for uh, nice benchmarking and uh, dividing up uh, analysis of the different antibiotics that are used. Um, so if an organization is doing that, they guaranteed they meet the standard. So that's uh, a nice uh, way of, we think, incentivizing that. Next. Uh, the next is uh, implementing evidence-based guidelines and the antibiotic stewardship program implements at least two evidence-based guidelines to address the most common indication for antibiotic use. As I said, uh, most organizations uh, were doing um, two or more. So we think that this, uh, hopefully they will go beyond 
um, what is uh, the, the minimum. Uh, again, many were doing, uh, for, uh, about half were doing uh, those top four for CAP, UTI, skin and soft tissue infection, et cetera. Uh, but we hope that they'll go beyond that, especially that inappropriate treatment for asymptomatic bacteria. That's such a big problem. I'm hoping that people are gonna tackle that. Next. And uh, the next is evaluating adherence to guidelines. As I said, this we see is one of the big problems. If you don't have data on how well you're doing following your guidelines, it's hard to drive improvement. So the uh, standard is the antibiotic stewardship program evaluates adherence, including antibiotic selection and duration of therapy where applicable to at least one of the evidence-based guidelines the hospital implements. So, and the hospital can measure adherence at the group level, so departmental unit, clinician subgroup, an ICU, et cetera, um, or at the individual prescriber level. As I said before, the individual prescriber profiling is really challenging, um, but uh, that is not required. So hospitals can just look at the group level for the groups that they choose to concentrate on. And the hospital may obtain adherence data from a sample of patients from either relevant clinical areas by analyzing electronic health records or by conducting chart reviews. We know that many organizations, they have trouble with IT resources and, and trying to do this uh, through their EHR is challenging. So we are allowing if um, there's a sampling, uh, looking at uh, detailed chart reviews, that's fine. Next. Uh, and of course, the hospital takes action on improvement opportunities um, identified uh, by the antibiotic stewardship program. So that could either be on their total antibiotic use, uh, specific subgroups of antibiotics, fluoroquinolone overuse, or something directly related to their measurement of adherence to their guidelines. Next slide. Uh, we did also have to include conditions of participation. Uh, many of you may know that our standards came out about three years before the hospital, excuse me, uh, CMS came out with the hospital antibiotic um, stewardship um, COPs. Um, so those are now included because we do have to uh, survey to those as well. Um, this one says the antibiotic stewardship program demonstrates coordination among all components of the hospital responsible for antibiotic use and resistance. Um, so uh, all of the different groups um, that are included there. Um, and this is very similar to uh, one of our standards, not exact, um, but this should not be terribly difficult for organizations to meet. Next slide. Uh, the next one is challenging. Uh, the antibiotic stewardship program documents the evidence-based use of antibiotics in all departments and services of the hospital. So the program may promote the appropriate use of antibiotics in the form of order sets, protocols, policies, um, and the scope of the antibiotic stewardship program includes all departments and services that use antibiotics. Uh, we are trying to get more guidance from CMS on how much does this include um, outpatient uh, clinics, et cetera, that are under the, the hospital uh, CCN. Um, so uh, this is, is one that uh, we, we like the uh, uh, ambulatory standards for ambulatory programs. We uh, did come out with those. I won't be talking about those today, but uh, it's a very different model uh, than the hospital one. So um, this is uh, the one that, I, that may be challenging. Next slide. Uh, so we completed the field review for the revised standards in September uh, of uh, this year, and we anticipate pre-publication of the standards in early 2022. Uh, we want to give hospitals a long runway to address these so they won't go into effect on survey until January of 2023. Now, of course, COVID, we thought when we were working on this, that COVID would be um, settling down, but it's you know been resurg resurgent with a vengeance with Delta and many places are still struggling horribly with this. Um, so we'll have to see about that implementation date. It, it really depends how much hospitals are continuing to be uh, pressed by COVID. Next slide. 
Uh, so we hope that these revised standards raise the bar. That was always our original vision, create that foundation with the first set of standards and then gradually uh, raise those up. So thank you for your attention and I'll turn it back to Melinda. Great, thank you so much, David. And we'll take questions from Dr. Baker at the end of the presentation. Excellent. Well, hello everyone. My name is Sarah Brinkman and I am a program manager at Stratus Health. Uh, through a cooperative agreement with the Federal Office of Rural Health Policy, and Natalia introduced you to them earlier on in the call, Stratus Health serves as the Rural Quality Improvement Technical Assistance Center. This affords us the opportunity to work with the 45 state flex programs around the country and the 1,300 plus critical access hospitals that they support with quality reporting and improvement efforts. I am really excited today to be able to introduce you to our panelists who are each going to take a few minutes to introduce themselves and their organizations. And then we have some questions that we'll be posing to them as well. I do want to just quickly address those who have been asking for slides in the chat. You'll see that um, the recording and slides will be sent out to all participants when available. So they are coming your way um, and, and just keep, keep an eye out for those. So I just uh, quickly want to introduce the folks who are going to be speaking with us today. We have Dr. Zara Kasamali Escobar. She is uh, Associate Medical Director at the University of Washington Tele Antimicrobial Stewardship Program, which is called UWTASP. Uh, also on the line today is Natalia Martinez Paz, who is the UWTASP Manager. We have Janet Shade, who is the Director of Pharmacy at Forks Community Hospital in Forks, Washington and Dr. Jessica Ziering, who is the antimicrobial stewardship pharmacist at Astria Sunnyside Hospital in Sunnyside, Washington. So I'm going to now um, hand things over to Dr. Uh, Zara Kasamali Escobar to introduce us to the UW TASP program. Next slide, please. Hello, thank you, Sarah, for that introduction. And I'm really excited to be joining everybody today uh, to talk about UW TASP and our work in antimicrobial stewardship with our rural health partners. Um, and I am speaking as an associate medical director on the UW TASP program and on behalf of our UW TASP faculty who are on the slide, John Lynch, Chloe Bryson Khan, Jeannie Chan, Rupali Jain, Paul Pottinger, and our program manager, Natalia Martinez Paz. Next slide. So UW, uh, UW TASP is, this is a very, um, I took a lot of liberties with the map of the United States, as you may see, um, but the UW TASP has many rural health uh, partners and critical access hospitals. And we originated in Seattle and in the Pacific Northwest region, and we've slowly um, grown and made new partners from Washington, Oregon, Idaho, um, to one hospital in Maine, as well as partners in Utah and Arizona. Next slide. The idea behind UW TASP is about leveraging our resources on a regional basis. And so faculty at the University of Washington include in in infectious diseases, specialists and experts, ID pharmacists, microbiology experts, nursing colleagues, and we interact with healthcare teams and rural medicine expert, experts in our critical access hospitals. Um, in addition to information going from faculty to partners, the information comes from partners back to faculty because it is very much a reciprocal partnership and between critical access hospitals themselves. Next slide, please. So as you can see, as we've grown, our community has really grown and many of our calls end up being our hospitals discussing some of their interventions with each other, which I'll show you examples with shortly. Next slide. Some of the learning resources. So the UW tasks, our, our structure is that we meet on a weekly basis over Zoom and 
for an hour, we, t we talk, um, first of all, about some type of didactic topic for 10 to 15 minutes. And then for the rest of the time, we talk about cases or stewardship issues, or in the last two years, a lot of COVID related issues that have our uh, institutions and our partners have been dealing with. So on this slide, you can see examples of some of the presentations we did in the last month, um, including oral antibiotics for gram negative bacteremias, uh, C. difficile, um, talking about asymptomatic bacteria, setting SMART goals, quality improvement, um, as well as COVID vaccination boosters. On our website, we also include toolkits for our uh, institutions, our partnership institutions to use. And this is, is an example of the COVID-19 toolkit, which we put up really early in the pandemic as Seattle was one of the first places with detectable cases. And we were dealing with this right so early on um, and as you all know, we all had to reinvent the wheel. So um, in this case, all the information was placed centrally for all of our partners to use. Next slide. In addition to the website, we have created this antibiotic pocket guide. And like Dr. Baker was talking about earlier, the goal of the pocket guide is to create institutional or local guidelines for our critical access hospitals. So this pocket guide uh, is literally that, it fits inside a white, white coat pocket. And um, it goes through different organ systems and syndromes, infectious syndromes, to help guide prescribers through um, not only symptoms, risk factors, and diagnoses to look out for, um, but also appropriate treatment approaches, whether that's antibiotics or whether that's not antibiotics. Next slide. And as I mentioned, this is a reciprocal sharing type of community. And this is an example from one of our critical access hospitals, Lincoln Hospital, um, presenting their hospital highlight. This was back in February, where they came in and talked about building their antibiogram, um, some of the challenges they faced and had to overcome, and sharing that information with some of our partners who were also finding themselves facing similar situations and building their own antibiograms. Next slide. Although our, our usual meeting is over Zoom, we did uh, have our first annual conference in person uh, in 2019. And you may guess that in 2020 and 2021, we have not had in-person uh, second or third annual conferences and hoping to bring that back in the future. And another part of what we, we did pre-pandemic um, was we conducted site visits. So our task faculty at the University of Washington would travel out to our critical access hospital sites, um, get to know the, the participants on site, sometimes present a grand rounds and learn more about from our rural medicine experts. Next slide. But in the meantime, we continue our partnership over Zoom. As you can see, this is also mainly pre-pandemic since nobody is masked, um, which is how we usually see our partners these days. Um, and we continue to engage with our partners uh, on a weekly basis, talking about all the ID things that we face, stewardship issues um, that each, uh, each hospital is facing locally. So thank you for your time today. And I'd like to turn this back over to Sarah. Thank you so much, Sarah, that was wonderful. Now we're going to turn to Janet Shade, who's going to give us an overview of Forks Community Hospital and their antibiotic stewardship program. Good afternoon. On behalf of Forks Community Hospital, I would like to thank HRSA and the CDC for sponsoring this webinar. Antimicrobial stewardship is such an important topic. Forks Community Hospital is the most Northwestern hospital in the continental United States in the great state of Washington. Three sovereign indigenous nations reside here. The area is beautiful and remote. Logging is the main industry. We're surrounded by Olympic National Park, Pacific Ocean beaches, hiking, and a destination for Twilight fans. Unfortunately, illicit drug use is not uncommon, and all of this impacts antimicrobial stewardship at Forks. Next slide, please. In 2016, the CEO asked me what I knew about antimicrobial stewardship, launching our program with leadership from medical staff, nursing, safety, quality, risk, lab, and infection prevention. 
Please note that all accomplishments I talk about today came through much appreciated teamwork. We took an educational approach and wrote a two credit CME program for providers through the Washington Medical Commission. Our surgeon recommended an antimicrobial stewardship moment at every board of commissioners meeting, every meeting of management committees and some departments. These messages were timely, informative and even fun. Annual staff mandatories included a module so everyone from environmental services through the chief of staff know their part. We even published articles in the local newspaper to involve the community. Internally, handshake stewardship reigns. Our annual antibiogram was just one tool for providers to use in empiric prescribing. The state of Washington posts antibiograms from other hospitals, which is very helpful when caring for travelers to forks. Another tool is the University of Washington antibiotic guide that Zara was talking about. We use it especially for tips on resistance patterns in the Pacific Northwest. CPOE order sets and protocols were developed and we were the first critical access hospital in the US to report NHSN antibiotic use real time through our electronic health record. We report to the Washington State Hospital Association monthly and provide stats directly to the other disciplines in our facility. See, in a tiny hospital, everyone wears many hats. So to avoid team fatigue, we rolled our activities into specific committees within six months. In an era of practicing evidence-based medicine, we were looking for accomplishments we could sustain, like the Department of Health Honor Roll, for one. We were also the first critical access hospital in the US to attain certification through the DNV accrediting agency for managing infection risk, now known as certification in infection prevention. But the hallmarks I was looking for came from our staff. When an emergency department provider shared with his colleagues about wait and see prescribing, I felt validated. He got it, he did it, and he told others about it. The bottom line, it's all about the safest, most cost-effective care for our patients, every patient, every time. Thank you. Glenn, thank you, Janet. And now we'll turn to Dr. Jessica Zering to speak to us about Astria Sunnyside Hospital. Thank you so much for that introduction, Sarah. And I'd like to also thank uh, CDC and HRSA as well for hosting this webinar today. So hello everybody from Sunnyside, Washington. Our little hospital of course is 25 beds in size. We are part of the two hospital Astria Health System. So our sister hospital is actually not a critical access hospital. They are a 78 bed hospital. They are located in Tavanish. So Estria Sunnyside Hospital proudly offers to its community a med surge unit, an ICU, an emergency department, an obstetrics floor, multiple rural health centers, an oncology center, and to a limited extent also antibiotic outpatient infusions. Uh, we additionally are proud to offer community an elective percutaneous coronary intervention program as well. So the actual town of Sunnyside, Washington is a small rural farming community. We're located about three hours east of Seattle and we're in the heart of wine country. Uh, our po patient population is both diverse and medically complex. Next slide, please. So our program here at Sunnyside Hospital is five years young. So I am the lead for the program here at Sunnyside Hospital and um, stewardship is written into my job description. I work with our pharmacy and therapeutics physician head on our policies and our protocols here at the hospital. I receive education and support on a weekly basis through the UW task program that Zara just discussed with us. Uh, our program operates off of the, from the standpoint that antibiotic stewardship is first and foremost a medication safety initiative. This pathway was really inspired by a patient who many years ago, unfortunately had a serious adverse drug reaction due to an antibiotic and ended up hospitalized for a week. Antibiotics have caused some of the worst side effects that I've witnessed as a pharmacist. And we're kind of, we're basically hoping that a good stewardship program can kind of help protect our patients from some of these adverse outcomes. So the hours for our program and my department, uh, 7.30 a.m., 6 p.m. daily. 
we have four pharmacist FTEs here on site, of which only mine is involved in antimicrobial stewardship. Our after hours processes consist of a telepharmacy and an on-call on pharmacist as well, if um, advice is needed. So the data that we report monthly, we report to our board of directors, our p and committee, and the Washington State Hospital Association. I'm excited to report that we are also currently in the process of getting set up for reporting to NHSN as well. So we track here the number of interventions made by pharmacy staff, plus the acceptance rate as well, days of therapy of certain broad spectrum antibiotics, and any adverse drug reactions that we encounter from antibiotics. On the outpatient stewardship side, we also track the number of RXs that are written for fluoroquino fluoroquinolones, say that 10 times fast, for UTIs. Uh, and so I report all of this data put together to the first two committees, the, or the first two mentioned on that slide. The last one, Washington State Hospital Association, I only report days of therapy of broad spectrum antibiotics. So that, so our program here proudly offers inpatient rounding, so hand, handshake stewardship, outpatient stewardship program as well. To a limited extent, we also have anti outpatient antibiotic infusions. We have facility specific prescribing guidelines and we also have education of staff. We educate patients as well in the community. We have an antibiogram and our antibiogram is stratified for some of the UTI organisms where I was able to statistically significantly stratify them as well. And we also offer prospective audit and feedback, uh, especially on the outpatient side with peer-to-peer -peer ranking. We have procalcitonin in our lab and we have microbiology on site and our stewardship program actually is what got procalcitonin here into our hospital. We educate our staff on an annual basis through a computer module on antibiotic stewardship. And we also strive to educate our community through CDC posters that are posted up in our clinics and in our emergency department. Thank you for your time. Excellent, thanks so much, Jessica. So I mean, we're gonna jump right into some questions for our panelists, noting that we are running short on time and we know that there are questions coming in in the chat too that are being addressed. Um, let's jump in first, Janet and Jessica, both of you have indicated that participation in UW TAS has been helpful in your antibiotic stewardship journey. Can you highlight a couple of key takeaways from your participation in that initiative? And Janet, can you kick us off? Of course, the University of Washington Medical School is number one in the nation for rural health. So we know they have our best interests at heart. They support us in many ways since we have no infectious disease provider. We were their first on-site visit of the task team in 2016, where John Lynch provided a slide presentation to our medical staff meeting and inspired everybody. They also reviewed our hospital formulary and validated the drugs needed for what we might encounter. The nearest hospitals to us are 60 miles to the east and 100 miles to the south, so we have to be prepared. Every question or case study we submit is carefully considered and we always get an individual response. These experts also provided insights about developing protocols and have even shared order sets and other examples we then developed for our own, like prevention of C. diff or treating sepsis, along with a penicillin allergy testing program and often we're put in touch with other TASP attendees who may have a similar issue to what we have faced and they collaborate with us as a network. We would still perform antimicrobial stewardship without TASP, but we wouldn't want to. Excellent, thanks, Janet. Jessica, anything that you would add from your experience? Absolutely, so I think for us, the two biggest takeaways were just the support for tough barriers and the quality of the education that's provided. So. One example was one of their ID physicians actually called and spoke to a couple of key providers in my organization when I ran into a bit of a barrier in terms of kind of educating and explaining the benefits of stewardship. And so having that support, especially from somebody who was a peer, being able to directly speak to this effort really was very helpful. Additionally, the education that UW TAS provides is both multidisciplinary and it's very evidence-based. So right now we're tackling asymptomatic bacteria in my organization. So UW TASP actually has a toolkit, a wonderful toolkit that is full of evidence, strong evidence, and lovely handouts, visual handouts that I can either just directly hand out to my providers 
or I have the flexibility of customizing my own one page handout from their materials that I can hand out to providers. And additionally, being able to hand out these educations and say, like Janet was referring to, this comes from the University of Washington is very powerful. It lends a lot of credibility to what we're doing. It increases confidence. And I think it also increases physician interest as well in what you're providing for them. That's an excellent point. Thanks, Jessica. We have heard in focus groups that we've done that physician buy-in is a big big barrier to antibiotic stewardship. So having, having a, an entity like UW TASP in your corner obviously can go a long way. Zara, and I, I can see that Natalia is answering some questions in the chat too, which is excellent. Can you speak to any advice that you have for hospitals or others that are interested in participating in or starting something like UW TASP? Yeah, thanks, Sarah, for that question. So yeah, the first the first thing about participating in UW TASP is reaching out to Natalia Martinez Paz, our program manager, whose email is in the chat. Um, but thinking about starting a program or something similar, um, you know, the main part of this is really based on relationships. Like um, Janet mentioned, Dr. John Lynch came out and gave a talk, and he really inspired folks and really built those relationships. And some, similar to building an antimicrobial stewardship program in your own institution, the hugest piece of that is creating those relationships. So I would say um, for our hospitals, you know, reaching out to each other, because a big part of UW TASP is connecting critical access hospitals to each other, and also, uh, and or also the larger, maybe academic medical center that's in your region. Excellent, thank you. Janet and Jessica, I'm gonna actually post this, um, this little factoid in the chat. On the, on the 2020 NHSN annual facility survey, only 46% of cause indicated that they have antibiotic stewardship written in as a job description. Both of your facilities do. You were selected in part because you're such high uh, performers when it comes to antibiotic stewardship. Can you please speak to how you went about getting antibiotic stewardship written into a job description? And what advice do you have for other hospitals to ensure that they're hardwiring this work into their organization? And Jessica, we'll, we'll start with you. So I was actually approached uh, five years ago by the CNO and the director of pharmacy at the time about antimicrobial microbial stewardship. So our CNO had an interest in improving quality of care through antimicrobial stewardship. And she approached my the director of pharmacy at the time and asked what that would look like. And so the director knew that I was very passionate about this already. And so he came to me and asked me if I would be interested in taking this on. And so from there, I basically was the leader of the program. And then about three years later into it, he approached me again and asked me if I could be, if I would lead the outpatient stewardship initiative. So as far as hardwiring this and ensuring that this, uh, being able to do this in your institution, I would advise find someone who's really passionate about antibiotics, antimicrobial stewardship, and then just ask them if they'd be interested in doing, doing this, basically start out with something real small and something achievable. Great, thanks, Jessica. Janet, anything that you would add? You know, it's been predicted that in less than 50 years, there will be few or no antibiotics that are effective to treat infectious diseases if we do not do antimicrobial stewardship now. Our children and our grandchildren could die from something simple like strep throat or a urinary tract infection. Mm -hmm. That's important enough to have someone in our organizations formally designated for uh, antimicrobial stewardship now. And you need a physician champion too. And we've shown in our organization with our staff mandatories that everyone has a part. So truthfully, antimicrobial stewardship should be in everyone's job description. Great, thanks, Janet, agreed. So we know that data is a key driver in healthcare and a few, and you both spoke a bit to data in your overview um, and that the data that you use and share needs to be tailored to different audiences. We know that NHSN offers the AU option, which includes among other things, the ability to track on days of therapy per days present at the patient care level and other hospitals have adopted other ways of tracking data um, I know that there were some questions that came into the chat, Janet, regarding Health Works Community Hospitals reporting, and it looks like a colleague of yours was able to address those. 
Can you speak to the ways in which you're da sharing data with frontline staff, prescribers, and leadership at your organization to inform and drive your antibiotic stewardship work? Well, early on, I established a dashboard that I divided into activities related to prevention, detection, and treatment of infectious diseases. We tracked vaccinations, PPE use, hand hygiene audits that our EVS workers did as secret shoppers. And at the end of the year, I looked at our costs and reported to administration in the first year, we saved 11% on our antibiotic expenditures adjusted for patient days. And that savings has continued to grow, which is a side effect of antimicrobial stewardship we were expecting to see and did. And these stats are all shared at relevant meetings so everyone can see the results of our efforts and start performance improvement projects if needed for areas that are lagging behind where we wanted to be. We did proactive risk assessments of different areas to establish priorities for the safety and quality initiatives. And we even do a root cause analysis of every MDRO and C. diff case that exists. Guess what? We found with our protocol to prevent C. diff and the results of our root cause analysis that every one of those cases was not hospital acquired. But I, I can't emphasize enough, communicate, communicate, communicate for engagement and success. Excellent. Jessica, you noted that you're preparing to report to the NHSN AU option, but obviously are doing other reporting. You spoke to that a bit. Is there anything else that you would add? So I would agree fully with what Janet says. Communication is very, very key. And so one thing that I try to do is I try to put antimicrobial stewardship also into each committee agenda meeting that I attend. Um, okay. Additionally, what I do as well is every year I track our MDRO data and I get, I try to produce a visual document that shows our providers where these are being isolated from. Are they inpatient? Are they outpatient? Mm -hmm. And what, and basically how prevalent are they in our general population? And so that data is hopefully kind of helps providers feel reassured that, hey, we don't need to use the broad spectrum antibiotic. Um, but definitely communication, put it in every committee meeting, just have five minutes in every committee meeting that seems to be the key driver. I've tried to e do emails as well, um, but again, it's not as effective as actually putting it on a committee meeting agenda and directly addressing it. So that's kind of what I do. Excellent, thank you. I know we have more questions, but I also know that we're getting to the top of the hour. So I wanna to turn to a couple of the questions that we received in the chat for Dr. Baker. Uh, Dr. Baker, can you speak to, does, does the Joint Commission look at inappropriate diagnostic testings in emergency departments? Uh, we don't require that to be done, but uh, if you look at the uh, guidelines that we talked about in the adherence, um, that is on the list and would be an absolute great quality improvement project for organizations to work on. Excellent. Thank you. And then are, are the standards that you presented what's to be expected to be finally published, or are you still reviewing the public commentary that ended in September? Uh, so we're done with the review. We have made edits. Um, I will just say it's never over till it's over, but you know it comes down to minor changes in wording at this point. Um, and the, the basic concepts that we've talked about won't change. Okay, excellent, thank you. It is three, three o'clock central time. It's three o'clock where I am. It's five o'clock somewhere. And it's probably time to wrap things up for the day. Um, for those of you that had questions about the recording and the slide deck, they will be sent out to all participants. Um, I, uh, on behalf of the CDC and HRSA, neither of which are my employer, I'd like to thank you all for joining us today. This is an excellent event. Obviously, there's a lot to discuss and we could continue to go on and on. I do want to call out, I posted a link in the chat to our MBQIP monthly newsletter. Um, Janet Shade at Forks Community Hospital has an a antibiotic stewardship profile in our November edition. And um, Dr. Zering's uh, profile for Estria Sunnyside Hospital will be coming up in January of 2022. So keep an eye out for those. Those are other great opportunities and resources that are available. Um, thanks, everyone, for joining us. Have a wonderful antibiotic stewardship week and happy rural health day tomorrow.